delighted to welcome our guest, the Reverend Dr. Jeff Dong from our church. Jeff is, uh, as I said, Minister of Wesley Uniting Church in Forest. His work has been shared between parish, academic, and administrative roles within and beyond the Uniting Church. Jeff will ask a question about Carl Jung understanding of God through experience and reason. You may recall Robbie Tulip's talk here previously about Jung's book, Answer to Joe, and Modern Man in Search of a Soul. The record of these is, of course, available from our website. You don't want to hear me telling about Jeff's varied experience, as I can say that it includes working areas of social justice, welfare, ageing policy development, industrial relations, practice and ethics. He's worked on Uniting Church programs in India, the Philippines, in Africa, with AusAid in South Sudan and the Philippines, in Chile, Argentina and El Salvador on human rights challenges. Jeff holds Australian degrees in economics, industrial relations, divinity, theology, and philosophy, and a PhD in philosophy, theology, and ethics from Boston University. Following Jeff's presentation, we'll have a short break and resume for discussion and questions. Now that we'll be recording this event for later reference. If you're here on Zoom, please remain muted while Jeff is speaking. Use Zoom chat for comments and we'll open up later for discussion. Thank you, and just we're very happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, look, it's good to be with you tonight. Um, um, I was asked some time ago by Jeannie and by Robert to... Was it May? Was it that long ago? Okay, right, yeah. And um, uh, I felt somewhat inadequate about this, but... Um, you know, psychology isn't my, my major field. And uh, I, for that reason, I wondered aloud with Jeannie before I accepted. But um, I wanted to give this a shot, so to speak. Okay. So hence, uh, I'm with you tonight. Um, so let's begin. Um, as Carl Jung aged, it's said that he moved away from the particularities of human beings toward his religious preoccupations. And he wrote this, I find that all my thoughts circle around God like the planets around the sun. At another place, he avered that there is a God-shaped hole in the human psyche that needs to be filled. And he added, God is a universal experience which is obfuscated only by silly rationalism and equally silly theology. For Jung to believe or to disbelieve in the irreducible fact of God was an absurdity. God is. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Um, and as I implied in what I've just said, I accepted this invitation with some degree of trepidation because I really didn't know much about Carl Gustav Jung. Indeed, it's only really been in recent weeks when time has permitted that I've been free to grasp in a disciplined way Jung's life and his thought. Additionally, I feel somewhat inadequate because it seems to me I should be the most unlikely candidate to speak about Jung, for I'm one of those people with whom he would not be impressed. I've spent most of my life doing silly theology. But um, I would still love to speak to him and to, um, and to discuss with him his ideas, and perhaps that may happen in another life. In general, I concur with Jung as to the fundamental nature of the human experience of God. As a child, I vividly recall an experience of God on Lake Manmora, 
in New South Wales when I was on a sailing camp there. And then again in my early teens in the Southern Highlands. And then later still as an older teenager with an altogether more cerebral experience related to a Marxist view about social justice. That was the context of my experience of God. Where I don't concur with you is his evaluation of theological reason. So I believe that theological reason, Christian theological reason in particular, which has been you know, my area for many, many years, is a legitimate and useful pathway to building meaning in our lives. So by way of method tonight, I, I would like to do the following. I, firstly, I'd like to offer some insights about Freud, Jung's mentor before they fell out. Then I want to move from there and reflect upon Jung's internally contrastive reading of God, first through human spiritual experience and then through reason. And I want to refer, as Robbie did earlier on, when he spoke about Jung, to his final work, Answer to Job. And then thirdly, I want to turn to the problem that Jung raises in his theological depiction of God, the modern metaphysical and the ethical question of theodicy. We understand in theology that theodicy is that attempt to justify the goodness of God in an evil, unjust and suffering world. That's the question that Jung takes on in his answer to Job. His lack of confidence in rational Christian theology, nevertheless, he embraced as he dealt with the Job question. So first to Freud and then on to Jung and then on to this question of theodicy. Freud, along with Marx and Nietzsche, figured among the greatest demystifiers of cultural idealism. It was Nietzsche who proffered how much blood and cruelty lies at the bottom of all good things. For all three men, in different ways, culture and morality are nothing less than the fruit of a barbarous history, the fruit of debt, torture, revenge, obligation, and exploitation. For all three men, for Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, history is no more than just a gruesome dominion of nonsense and accident. <coughs> for Freud, this necessity of demystification, stripping away illusion so that we might become grown-ups and see things as they are, follows a particular trail, and it's a particular trail to God and to belief and to religion. Ernest Jones, one of Freud's most notable biographers, depicts him as a born atheist from one end of his life to the other. Freud never saw any reason to believe in a supernatural being, nor did he ever feel an emotional need to entertain such a belief. For Freud, as for Ludwig Feuerbach, his influential philosophical predecessor, religion was no more than the objectification of subjective human feeling. Human beings have created their own gods and religions as embodiments of their idealized aspirations, of their needs and fears. Freud, using a different vocabulary, to Marx or Nietzsche spoke of God and religion as mere wish fulfillment, mere wish fulfillment. Deepening this idea of wish fulfillment, Freud argued that the origin of religion lies in our impotence vis-a-vis -vis the external forces of nature and the instinctive forces that lie within us. How else? he argued, could primitive people have faced up to the terrors of life without the comfort offered by the illusion of religion. For Freud then, the turn to religion was all about childhood. People recalled how they protected they had felt by their fathers to whom they had attributed superior wisdom and power. 
And so at the end of his study of Leonardo da Vinci, Freud summed up his view accordingly. Psychoanalysis has made us cognizant of the intimate connection between the father complex and faith in God. It has taught us that the personal God is simply an exalted father in psychological terms. But Freud gets even more interesting as he debunks religion. He becomes more lugubrious, more mythologized and somewhat labored as he associates religion with the Oedipus complex. Wait for this. For Freud, primeval re re rebellious sons murder the dominant father for his refusal to allow sexual contact with his women. Accordingly, argues Freud, religion becomes no more than an attempt to resolve the guilt feelings that arose from the murder of the primordial father back in the mists of time. Freud's eyes, satisfaction and sacrifice offered to God are clearly attempts to expiate that guilt and promote reconciliation with the mythological father. So it's safe to say that Freud is clear that religion results from a deep neurosis. Religion is to be interpreted in terms of the unconscious, leading to the conclusion that no objective reality really lies behind it at all. God and religion are definitively illusions. Is it something that we can rescue from Freud? And as I ask that question, I guess I ask it as a practicing Christian. And on balance, I think we can. I think Freud actually offers us some real insights, although I don't buy the whole package. Like Feuerbach and Nietzsche, Freud sought to strip away what he saw as human metaphysical illusions. Freud wanted to free up science and scholarship so as to find genuine roots in reason and in reason alone. Freud, in his vision, wants us to regain the power that we apparently lost when eons ago we projected ourselves into the imaginary transcendent realm. So there is an integrity to Freud, I think. Freud is seeking truth. Although, again, I would tell you that I don't buy the whole package. His perceptions of religion, I think, are fundamentally flawed. Let's now turn to Jung. Because Jung is very different. And I'm not quite sure what the reasons for the falling out between Freud and Jung were. But given their differences in opinion, I could understand perhaps there were many explanations. The word religion comes from the Latin, religare. And religare in Latin means to be tied back to or to be grounded in. And in keeping with that term, you may have heard of the theologian Paul Tillich, the 20th century figure who escaped Germany and relocated in the US. He became known as what we call a theologian of correlation. It was Tillich who spoke about God as the ground of our being. We are tied back to God in our existence. And I sometimes suspect that Jung may have actually warmed to that idea. I could just imagine Tilly and Jung speaking, talking, conversing in heaven. And so to my point, what stands out in Jung is a certain dichotomy. There's a disjunction, I think, in Jung's thought between experience on the one hand and reason on the other. And I'd like to explain that to you. Let me dig a little deeper. <coughs> For Jung, in sharp contrast to Freud, experience of God, experience of what he called the numinous, is fundamental to the human condition. 
any reading of Jung's early development explains his openness to the spiritual. His father was a Lutheran priest for whom young Karl felt enormous sympathy in large part because he could observe his father tormented in his doubt-ridden Protestantism, particularly entrapped by the church's theological teaching. Jung's mother was a figure of contrast to his father. She, on the surface, was a conventional pastor's wife, but as Jung put it in his memoirs, unreliable, by which he probably meant volatile. And there's no doubt that she was, unlike her husband, given to spiritual experience, and she dabbled in the occult. It's recorded that upon her husband's death, she mysteriously commented to her son, as if an oracle, he died in time for you. For his part in early, his early years, Jung also tended to show orientations to the numinous, to, to the spiritual. Jung came to think of himself as having two personalities, which he called number one and number two. Number one was his identity his personality as the child of his parents. Number two was that he was a timeless individual, as he put it, having no definable character at all, born, living, dead, everything in one, a total vision of life. At school, it said his peers picked up these tendencies that Jung had and referred to him jokingly as Father Abraham. Writing later upon his understanding of things that he had experienced, he observed this. I've always tried to make room for anything that wanted to come from within. He renamed personality number one and personality number two as the ego and the self. And he commented that achieving the right balance between the ego and the self, these two aspects of the psyche, was critical to his theory of personality development, his theory of individuation. In attempting to draw conclusions about Jung's priority for religious experience, rather than reason, rather than theology, I noted a piece from his letters, which offers some help, and he wrote this. I'm not a philosopher, but a doctor and an empiricist. Religious motives appear in dreams and fantasies for the obvious purpose of regulating the attitude and restoring the disturbed equilibrium. These experiences, he continued, compelled me to come to grips with religious questions, or rather to examine the psychology of religious statements more closely. And that's the point, I think, that for Jung, religious experience is of primary interest. And that's where he contrasts sharply with Freud. But reason theology is not a primary interest. There is a separation between the two. And yet, nevertheless, Jung, in his later life, finds himself necessarily and irresistibly drawn from psychological empiricism to theological speculation. And perhaps the most difficult area of theological speculation, and that is metaphysical and moral theology. This question of theodicy, again, the justification of the goodness of God in an evil, unjust and suffering world. As I read him and as I read about him, I posed this question, what led you to move from his priority for religious experience across to his own theological, rational enterprise, doing theology? And I'm not sure that it's entirely well known why that move took place. 
I don't know, but I can surmise. And I suspect that it may have had to do with Jung's vehement criticism of and his impatience with the modern directions of theology. For Jung, theology had to honor its tradition, dealing with the numerous, dealing with the questions of the mystery of life, the metaphysical questions, if you like. And what annoyed him was that theology was becoming much more worldly. It was, in a sense, rationalizing even the symbols of the faith. So in modern theology, the question of resurrection was rationalized. Modern theology has sought to explain resurrection in historical terms, in natural terms. Not very successful, I would say. Also, the idea of the kingdom of God. Jung was highly critical of the tendency of modern theologians to see the kingdom of God as a political vision of justice. As I, as I dug deeper into Jung and surmised and I guess hypothesized that this could have been the reason for his attempt to sort of start to think theologically because he was annoyed with the way theology was going, um, I noted that the corners of my mouth turned up a little bit with some humor because in this criticism that he made of modern theology, I felt myself targeted. I am part of that generation which has very much delved into issues of social justice theologically and work pastorally uh, in various countries in the world um, in defense of human rights. I'm not sure that Jung would have been impressed with that. For Jung, the numinous, the spiritual, has been sidelined in favor of the phenomenal, in favor of what we see. Things of the spirit have been pushed aside in favor of history. I suspect that we can thank Marx for that. It's Marx has influenced modern Christian theology, perhaps more than many. Let's turn to this question of theodicy then that, that Jung seeks to deal with in his final work, his answer to Job, the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible. And I could say a lot about this, but I, I want to make just three points and be as concise as possible. First, an initial comment about the Enlightenment of which we are all products. We are all offspring of the Enlightenment. During the Enlightenment, there was witnessed a fundamental change in attitude toward the existence of evil, toward the existence of injustice and suffering. The medieval period, the reality of evil never really posed an existential threat to the coherence of Christianity at all. The implicit contradiction in the coexistence of a benevolent divine power on one hand and evil on the other was not really regarded as an obstacle to belief. It was more of an academic question for the universities. But with the advent of the Enlightenment, everything began to change. The existence of evil metamorphosed into a major challenge for the credibility of Christian faith. Voltaire's novel Candida was one of the many works that highlighted the difficulty for the Christian worldview of this new recognition of natural evil, slated home in events such as the legendary 1755 Lisbon earthquake. The term theodicy was first coined around this time by the philosopher Leibniz as he reflected a growing recognition of evil as a fundamental problem for belief and believers. I add to that, that in my own experience, working in different countries in the world across different cultures, the question that is always put to me as a clergyman and as someone who thinks theologically is, well, how can you possibly believe in a God of compassion, love, in a world such as this, 
In fact, I never get any respite from this. My own wife, who is a um, former Marxist and now sort of an agnostic, always pursues this question with me. We, from the lounge room to the kitchen and so on, as we have these discussions. So it is a very much a modern question. It's a question which is fundamental and it's the question for Christian faith. This whole question of theodicy. How can you sustain possibility of belief in a loving God in a world such as the one that we live in and that we have. The second point I would make is this, that in answer to Job, a work that Jung himself later on branded as pure poison, God hardly emerges well with some cheek in the book of Job. God points out to Job that Job's bina or his wisdom needs refocusing. That Job in, Job in his innocent suffering really needs to get a handle on things. He needs more intellectual breadth. He needs cognitive imagination. Perhaps he even need, means, needs emotional distance from the reverses he has suffered. And, and in response to Yahweh or God's um, putting Job in his place. Jung bristles with rage. And he writes this. God comes riding along on the tempest of his almightiness and thunders at Job, this half-crushed worm. It appears that God is still intoxicated with his tremendous power and the grandeur of his creation. He rides roughshod over Job's human dignity. And continuing, Jung says, Job stands morally higher than Yahweh. Job stands morally higher than God. So for Jung, the story of Job is really about God's struggle to measure up to human standards rather than humans striving to measure up to God's standards. God, he proposed, is a blind and unconscious deity containing both good and evil within himself and dependent for his liberation on man's evolutionary struggle toward consciousness rather than vice versa. My third point. Jung's insights are plausible as I read the theology of Job. I would agree that God doesn't come out well. Jung's insights are plausible, bearing in mind enlightenment reasoning, which we've just talked about. Enlightenment reasoning about the weight and the importance of theodicy. Theodicy which turns everything on its head. When one takes an enlightenment view of history through the lens of theodicy, history is about the human judgment upon God, not God's judgment of human beings. The tables are turned. But having said that, having been in agreement essentially with Jung about the, the, the nature of the theology of Job, My problem is this, that Jung, in pursuing this line about Job, is merely repeating or replicating or duplicating the earlier line of the philosophers of suspicion, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. None of whom, unlike Jung, saw any need for God at all. In some then, Jung's borrowed philosophical theology, which we see through the lens of Job, sits awkwardly with his openness to God experientially. There is a dichotomy here, I think. There is a contradiction. Jung is dramatically open to the 
phenomenon of religious experience. He is dramatically open to God. On the other hand, theologically, in a few things that he says theologically, particularly this piece in answer to Job, he simply adopts the line of those who have preceded him, these philosophers of suspicion, as we call them, the great three, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. How to conclude what can be said? Yes, Freud and Jung fell out, but there is still something that binds them, it seems to me. And it is an honourable thing. For both men, the summum bonum is about self-knowledge, which includes a deep dose of courage, the courage to live. Where they differed as men and as thinkers was that Freud held that such knowledge necessarily comes through the eradication of God. God is a problem. For Freud, the human being had to throw off the patriarch, as he calls God, in order to be free. For Jung, on the other hand, true to his Protestant memory, as much as he disagreed with the theologians, humanist experience, spiritual experience was universal and it was crucial to the human disposition, to the human character. And true to form, he wrote this, you can't tear people into two parts and assign one of them to the doctors and the other to the theologians. Thank you. That's it. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, we might um, have um, some art supper and we come back and we have a few people that want to um, talk to us anyway so we might have supper now and then come back and have questions and then we'll have some talks from people like Kirsten and John and also if you want to talk to us so we'll have a few people with messages thanks so like to... just before we go we've got a special birthday and a special birthday girl here today and um happy birthday Jean for the Wednesday happy birthday and there is a cake out there so you'll get that and also just some okay. um, today is very special for Jeff yes yes yeah I, yes. yeah look yes. today has been it's a rather difficult today for us I I have four sons and one of them was killed in an accident on Christmas Eve in 2020 um, in Goulburn, he was electrocuted with a friend. Uh, his name was Andrew, and today is his birthday. This is the second birthday we've had without him. We had a little cake at home um, <laughs> with a couple of his friends at lunchtime, but um, uh, he would have been 33 today. So. Thank you very much. For <laughs> now we've got, we can share the cake. It's my birthday on Wednesday, so it's quite good. Nice. Word. good. <laughs> and for the people that have to have birthdays too, you can join in. Yeah, um, I agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, in, uh, what I didn't share with you was, um, you know, when, when I um, was working, I worked in Latin America for about 12 years during the Finnish dictatorship and then in Argentina. Before that, actually, the reconstruction of democracy after the Falklands debacle, you know, when the military collapsed. I was involved in uh, working with communities toward redemocratization, helping them understand what democracy was because the memory had been lost. And in El Salvador, I worked to the end of the Civil War. So I worked in broken communities. And it really um, exhausted me, you know, mentally and physically. And so I sought to, I, I chased a Jesuit up who was a spiritual director. And the, the gift of the Jesuits apart from being theologically liberal, which is where I sit. And so I, you know, I could talk to them in a way in which we could have worldviews that were similar. But the, the real gift of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus and the Catholic Church, is its spiritual tradition, the exercises of Ignatius. 
And I've had a number of retreats with Jesuits over the years. And one of the things which I've really found liberating is, you know, my own, um, my own journey does not have to fit into a, an orthodox preconceived path mm -hmm. by the church. This is coming from the Jesuits. Yeah. You know. And that, that really helped me enormously. Mm -hmm. So I think it really depends on who you talk to. <laughs> My advice to you is if, if you want to talk about a spiritual journey, mm -hmm. it's best to go to a priest or a clergyman if you want to, if you want to deal with the clergy at all, mm -hmm. who are of a liberal disposition. Doesn't mean that we're right about everything, you know. Yeah. Theology yeah. can be debated, yeah. but you need someone who's open-minded because I don't think God actually works according to equations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, God yeah. is not a mathematician. I don't think it yeah. is. Yeah. I think that yeah. our own individuality yeah. and our yeah. own journeys are respected by God. Yeah, and the journey that we take. Yeah, and our interpretations are also respected. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly true. Have the I know Jesuits in India that they uh, incorporate um, local traditions, like uh, there was a Dravidian group in uh, what was then Bihar, it's now uh, um, uh, Jharkhand, that uh, I visited them for a week at a time when they were having uh, some harvest festivals, which the Jesuits there incorporated yeah. into, the into the church. And I know they did that all over the yeah, world. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. it would be be denounced by the main, you know, the hard liners in the church is syncretistic. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, culture, the way cultures and religions intersect is a very, you know, um, it's, it's very contextual. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, context vary. I think one of the things I've learned over the years working across, you know, national boundaries and cultural boundaries is that culture and religion intersect in such a way where something new is created. And I think as long as no harm is done, mm -hmm. I think that those that, that sort of mixture, that mixing of culture and, and religious tradition needs to be respected. Yeah. 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 So is that helpful too? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Let's do next. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Robbie Tulip. Um, thank you so much for your uh, sharing your comments about Jung. I, I just found it very illuminating. I have had a, a lot of interest in that whole uh, period of um, European philosophy and, mm -hmm. and theology as, as a time of, of great confusion. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought that your uh, uh, reference to uh, Freud, March, Marx and Nietzsche like I know Paul Ricoeur used this phrase, the hermeneutic of suspicion, yeah. just this uh, automatic uh, questioning of, yes. of yeah. all received uh, authority. Yeah. And for you to, uh, to bring up that, that phrase, the gruesome dominion of nonsense and accident, mm. uh, I'm not sure who, who that was from, but one of those three. Uh, Nietzsche. 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 Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it's, it's this sense that the world is fundamentally irrational mm -hmm. that there is no telos That's there right. is no purpose there is yeah. no uh, rational direction yes. in nature yeah. and and i think that that was actually something that jung with his more mystical cosmology mm -hmm. rejected yes. he, he felt that there that there is a uh, a rational direction mm -hmm. and that that's something that comes up I think especially in his book Aeon, mm. but um, uh, it's it's something that he wrestles with yeah. in in answer to Job. And as you say, this idea that God had to evolve yes. from this uh, you know bloodthirsty tyrant to the uh, the compassionate Jesus, and that uh, Job was a, a major way station on that self reflection on the part of God about. What does it mean to be a god for people? Yes. And so I, I think that Jung really, really picked that up uh, really strongly. I, I took a couple of notes. So I'm just going to re refer to them. And you ask what led Jung 
to move from the priority of experience, experience of theology, to the rational theology. And yeah. I, th I think um, a big factor there was his, um, ex his personal experience as a practicing clinician, as a therapist, as a, a, a psychoanalyst, right. and finding the, uh, the healing power of faith in among his patients yeah. and this uh, this therapeutic role of uh, spirituality was something that freud had simply rejected like you know freud sure. had uh, had agreed with marx that uh, religion is false consciousness whereas uh, jung uh, he had come out of that enlightenment tradition through uh, feuerbach as you mentioned so ludwig feuerbach was a uh, a philosopher who said that God is a projection of the human imagination, not a transcendental being. And so he, uh, and so Feuerbach's theory of God was the basis of the Marxist we atheism. The basis for Marx and Nietzsche and everyone. Yeah. And, and so, whereas Jung was saying there is some sort of transcendent reality mm. that has a healing power if we can. Uh, engage through faith and yeah. so so there's this whole mystical dimension in uh in exactly. Jung's yeah yeah and I, you know I think um one, one of the you know when I was working in Latin America I worked in a movement called liberation theology which some of you may have heard about um it was really about the, the theology which was um it's quite a sophisticated theology but you know Marx shaped some of that theological thought along with the scriptural tradition tradition but it's very much a, a practical theology coming from the people from the masses and you know one of the things that, that you know in doing that work throughout Latin America uh, over the years over 12 years or more was you know my absolute conviction there's a spirituality to that there was a transcendent dimension to the struggle of the poor in Latin America for dignity uh, so it was political highly political but it was also highly um, numinous, you know, in, in that transcendent and all those things. So there's a fundamental spirituality for these very political, theological movements that were going on in Latin America. Um, and I've never seen anything quite like that. I'm, I've worked in Africa, but the African church, I think, you know, apart from South Africa, um, you know, in Zimbabwe and so on, it's very traditionalist. You know, you don't get new thinking in the way that you, that I experienced in Latin America, which I thought was. I was a young man then. You know, I'm an old guy now, but it was it was liberating for me. Liberation theology was absolutely quite liberating for me as a as a discovery in my own journey, and it always involved the, you know, the organic struggle, but also the spiritual journey. Both went hand in hand. You know, mm -hmm. I found that very moving. And we're, we're now seeing um, Pope Francis pick up on many of the lessons from liberation theology. Very much, yeah. I mean, Francis was a Jesuit and was also Archbishop of Buenos Aires when I was working in Chile. So, mm. yeah. so he's, he was always considered to be a, a, a bright light of the Latin American church. He, he was always careful about how he had identified with liberation thought. But it's clear that that's the directions he's going in, even as, as Pope now. So. And uh, like the liberation thinking does have a spectrum from Marxist Indeed. revolutionaries across, across. to a, a sort of social justice, yeah, liberalism. Yeah, more type stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. It, it's, it's a complex movement now. I mean, it, it was really the foundation for much of feminist theology in the First World and black theology mm -hmm. in some parts of Africa. Um, as well, so, yeah. Hmm. But, yeah, the Latins are very Latin American thinking is very subtle, nuanced, but also really adventurous. You know, that's what uh, appealed to me about the Latins. They were they didn't follow rules; they broke all the rules, <laughs> which was wonderful. You know, it was just magnificent to see. You know? Yeah. Oh. Can I bring a question? <laughs> by uh, Francis Colelli online. Francis is a uh, long-standing loyal member of the Jung Society who's with us virtually tonight. 
she says, I'd be interested to know what you think about Jung's view on the universal human need for religion, God, spirituality, in the light of the presence in history of religious wars, for example, the Crusades, Northern Ireland, the Holocaust, and more recently, fundamentalist terrorism. Religious beliefs being personal, deeply embodied and faith-based can be only things that are cons constant in the lives of humans. Mm -hmm. uh, can be only things, yes. They seem so important to people that they will fight to defend them or even to die for these beliefs. How do you think this sits with the inconsistency you spoke about in Jung's theology? I'm sure you can give a one sentence yeah, answer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. C can I, rather than refer to Jung, because I don't claim to be an expert about Jung, I could see why he might want to, not want to get into theology, given the way in which theology becomes a vehicle for tribalism. I think that's true. Um, I would refer... I would refer her back to Paul Tillich, who I mentioned earlier. Tillich, um, Tillich's got an interesting history. He was a, a, um, uh, a German pastor who was a German theologian. He escaped Nazi Germany, fled to the US, taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale and Harvard. And he was known as a the theologian of correlation. And theology of correlation is about the way in which his method of thought was to correlate theology with the real world, and the real world with theological insight. You know, so um, rather than having theology as something which was removed, you know, he addressed the contemporary questions of the day. Um, he wrote an article called the, "The Demonic," and in that article, he makes it very clear that religion, and this is the point I'm going to. Religion itself, whether it's Christianity or any forms of religion, carry a demonic dimension to them, almost invariably, almost inevitably. Um, and, you know, he, he, his thinking really arose from the way in which, you know, the Protestant church in Germany was pretty much corrupted during the, the Hitlerian years, the Nazi years, and there was what was created a German church. Um, which was very strong, um, but it was actually a Nazi creation and it was a complete contradiction to, to the Christian church. But he also acknowledges that the, the German church had been deeply anti-Semitic for generations. Um, and so, you know, they turned a blind eye to the persecution of the Jews in Germany and so on. And it was not just German, it was in Europe generally. Um, so I guess what I'd be saying to her, to the, to the person who's asked the question is, religion is quite capable of being a force for enlightenment and renewal and liberation for people, but it's also equally capable of becoming demonic um, in the way in which it can become deeply ideologized and perverse. I think the evangelical church in North America currently that supports Trump is an example of that sort of demonization of the church, the ideologization of the church. Um, so I'm very clear that religion has, and Christianity in particular, which is where I come from, has a very spotted history. Um, I'm well aware of its sins. I'm well aware of its um, deficits and its excesses. Um, and I think one always needs to be aware of the way in which the demonic is always possible particularly in the church, particularly in those organisations that claim high moral ground. <laughs> okay. It's always the institutions that claim the high moral ground that are in danger uh, of actually collapsing. Um, and you see it time and time again. So that would be my response. It's inadequate, but it's all I can offer now. Well, not only Christianity, of course. Look at the Buddhists in Myanmar, you know. Yeah, indeed. You know, I mean, no, indeed, no, it's not, it's not, by no, it's not unique to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Religion by its very nature, which claims, you know, usually a strong metaphysical grounding. And because of that, it tends to be absolutist in the way it sees things, which is what religion does. You know, it tends to be have absolutist categories. It means that people, th you know, when they claim it, they claim it, you know, um, passionately without reason. And that's why I think reason is so important. In, in religious identity because it helps you work through the issues in a rational way rather than to be grasped by one doctrine or another. 
um, which is what happens to people, I think, you know. Uh, yeah. So the demonic, Paul Tillich, it's an article that he wrote. It's a lot of, lot of observers sort of chart the rise of various fundamentalisms. Yeah. yeah. And whether you, agree, whether you agree or we have the evidence to say that's true or not, mm. I'm just wondering, Jeff, what your, what your view is on, as a theologian, on the, the value of doubt in theology versus the value of certainty well, and doubt, knowing the truth. Yeah. I'm a great fan of doubt. <laughs> um, and that's really goes back to my point about reason, because good reason always begins with um, questioning. And in the liturgy in the church in Wesley, before we read scripture, um, I recite a piece from the Uniting Church Liturgy, which, you know, it's in, in preparation to hear scripture. You know, that's so you offer a prayer in order to not just hear, but to listen, you know, to understand. And usually, you know, the usual prayers for those sorts of prayers of preparation, as they call them, you know, seek enlightenment and that sort of stuff, you know. But in this particular prayer, which is my favorite, is that it, it, it actually, um, in the prayer, it says, um, help us to ask the questions because the questions are more important than the answers. And I think that's exactly right. You know, I, in my journey theologically and philosophically, it's always been the questions which have driven me. And, but I'd have to say to you that I've never been able to give particularly clear answers to those questions because you have to always qualify them. You know, the answer is only ever partial according to your own experience. And then as you move on in your life, you can, in a sense, um, uh, qualify the qualification more, you know, as you have more life experience, uh, so on. So I think faith is all about questions. I actually don't think it's about definitive answers. And I, I've spoken to, you know, when, when I look at the whole same-sex marriage issue, um, in contemporary society, you know, the Uniting Church is the only church where we are have been licensed to marry same-sex couples. So we're well ahead of the mainstream churches, even though we are a mainstream church. But it is very controversial. And that the, the conservative side of the agenda in terms of the same-sex marriage, when you think theologically, always embrace doctrine. The doctrine of the church is a given. The doctrine of the church never changes. The more progressive side of the church in relation to same-sex marriage embraces ethics. So, and I, I'm the first to acknowledge that same-sex marriage is a problem for this church, doctrinal, but ethically it's actually necessary. You know, it's, a, it's from an ethical point of view, quality is fundamental, particularly in democracies. So when I talk to my conservative uh, confreres, um, I say, we still haven't got a clear answer as churches, whether it's a Catholic or the Protestant churches about same-sex marriage. But if you're not clear, then you defer to compassion. You defer to good ethics. You defer to creating space for people to live free, unpersecuted. And even my conservative friends, they, they think, yeah, that's not, a, that's not an unreasonable position to hold. So very seldom in the theological journey do you get definitive answers. Anyone who offers you definitive answers you need to be very suspicious of. <laughs> All you can ever get from the deep, profound questions of life are um, what I would call temporary responses. They can never be complete responses because life takes you on the journey and you're always having to further qualify your responses accordingly. That would be my own response. Is that helpful too? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just follow up. <laughs> the, 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 the current 
Christianity in the Western society are going, like Australia's case. Yeah, you see more secular, more secularization, or or more hardcore evangelical literalist yeah. fundamentalists arising yeah. and and trying. Look, to I see trend. both actually because I think one invites the other. Look, from a point of view of secularization, I'm not. I don't see secularization as the enemy at all. I, you know, one of the things that people don't understand is that, that it's the Christian church that actually generated the secular. Um, the secular doesn't exist anywhere else in the world apart from the West. It was the church that actually pushed the secular after the Reformation because of all the bloodletting that went on. So that was the beginning of secularization, you know, the reforming of government and the exclusion of the church so that you didn't get these religious fights going on between Catholics and Protestants. Um, so the secular, I think, is an honourable tradition generally. Uh, it has its own weaknesses and it has its own dangers. I have no doubt about that. Um, but I, I operate quite happily as a priest who is part of a secular society. Um, uh, but I think the reaction to that is this extreme evangelical identity, which has been generated. And usually it begins in the US and then it's exported elsewhere. Um, and I think, you know, evangelicalism is an attempt to find definitive answers in a world of greys and complexity. Uh, you know, I often say to myself and someone say to my wife, who is quite secular, you know, religious people are the most difficult people to get on with. You know, because they often hold views which are highly, um, you know, passionately held, but they're not prepared to rethink those views through. And I think, you know, my view is that the work of the Holy Spirit in Christian theology is to help you rethink all the time you know, as you come to clearer perspectives and as you ask deeper questions. That's what the Holy Spirit's all about in Christian theology. It's, it's a the Holy Spirit is to accompany you in the process of thinking, clarifying as you as you seek to live constructively and well. So the whole idea of faith that is dogmatized, I think, is a really dangerous thing. But I see it around me all the time. So I think we're going in both directions. I think each needs the other in a way. You know, the secular, the most secular of people who hate religion, and I don't think most secularist people are like that, you know, point to the evangelicals as, well, why would you want to go down that road? And I would agree. But then the evangelicals do the same. Uh, you know, dangers of the secular. And um, I, I don't actually fit in either of those camps. I sit somewhere, you know, in more nuanced positions, I think. But, so I think in answer to your question, um, you know, we live in a more secular world. Um, I think the Anglo world is particularly more secularized in Australia than the immigrant world is. One of the things which was really interesting looking at the North Shore of Sydney is that, you know, the North Shore has historically been very white. And that was where Anglicanism, the Sydney Diocese Anglican Church was incredibly strong. What is actually happening demographically, statistically, is that the white communities are becoming totally secularized. It's the immigrant communities that are embracing the church, whether they're Asian or Polynesian or whatever. It's really sort of an interesting phenomenon where, you know, people of my ilk are becoming much more secularized as white Anglo Saxon Protestants. And it's the, the non-Anglo-Saxon Protestants who are filling the pews in the churches. I, I find that fascinating. I'm not quite sure what to conclude from. Any other questions? I've got one. Thank you. Uh, if there's somebody else first. Jeff, I, I wanted to uh, explore your comment about the meaning of religion, where you, you looked at the etymology of the word religion yeah, really in terms of relegare as 
being binding and grounding. Now, uh, there's another there's another meaning of the uh, relegare, which is in our word ligament, and uh, so our ligaments are the uh, the sinews that connect bone to bone. So our our skeleton is connected by our ligaments, and and so uh, the just as the body is connected by ligaments, something about our life is connected by religion. Mm. Now, I, I think you were talking about the the problem of, uh, I suppose, what we could call an imperial faith, where we say we connect the tribe uh, yeah. by by religion, and we say, you know, the Trump tribe are connected by, by our shared religion, and we exclude everything else. Yeah. Uh, but then there's also a, a deeper sense of connection that uh, that religion provides a, a, a ultimately a connection to the cosmos yeah. uh, a a connection to our history to our I I identity I, I think one of the great things that's coming up in uh, aboriginal spirituality is this deep connection to such a long history uh, yeah. and and so so that that sense of religion as connection like we've got logos as uh, as a word that essentially means connection that uh, christ as a uh, as a central point of connecting us to an ultimate reality yeah. uh, so I, I think that that theme that you are raising about the meaning of religion is just really interesting and like yeah. if, if you have thoughts to uh, to expand in, well, in look response at, look, would be it, interesting it, it, i i you know i didn't invent that <laughs> as you know i mean it's through my reading but i think um one of the I, I, the, the area that I, I worked on in, in my PhD work, which has always remained with me, was the thought of a Spanish philosopher called Javier Zubiri. Um, and um, Zubiri was, he talked about, he, he developed a philosophy in the, during the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, called the philosophy of reality. And it was an, a, really an attempt to reinforce the fact that as people, we are grounded in the world. We are born into the world. We are grounded in the world through our relationships, through those who've come before us, who created us and so on, you know, through our parents and grandparents and so on. And so this, this whole idea of being grounded, being tied back to our roots, I think is very, very important. And I'm sharply aware of that. And as you, you know, as you get older, you realize, you know, I think my experience pastor is that when people get over 50, they start looking backward to their history. And they often get very angry. They get angry about their siblings who they had to compete with. And they get angry with their parents who they resent because of A, B, C, or D. But it's all part of the process. You know, I think up to 50, you're looking forward. But then when you hit 50, something happens to the brain, the synapses or something. And you start looking back and you look for your roots, I think, in a way that you don't in those first 40 years. In the first 10 years, you have the roots, you don't think about them. And then you spend your life sort of moving beyond them to establish your own life. And then by the time you get to 50 or so, you start looking back to try to sort of bring everything together. You know? um, and I, I think, you know, so from the point of view of, of the work I've done philosophically in Spanish philosophy through Zubiri, this whole idea, which is where the, the idea gem, um, germinated, was that we are grounded, we are tied back to God, we are tied back to, uh, to God through those who have come before us, who have shaped us and the communities of which we're a part. We're tied back through our children, uh, all those things. Um, and then ultimately, as we age, we, we look for that, to have that reinforced. Who are we? What's our identity? Who have we become? Those sorts of questions. So yeah, the whole idea of being tied back to, I think is really fundamental for the human psyche. And if I had, you know, Carl Gustav Jung here sitting with me, I'd ask him what his view would be of being tied back. I think he'd give some interesting answers. Yeah. Jeff, you might be interested, but we did have him here a while ago, 
difficulties of space and time and brought back uh, uh, Mahatma, the, the, the Buddha and uh, and Carl Jung and Carl and um, Alfred Korzebski. Oh, okay. Right. We had a, din a dinner table here and we had these wow. three people came back and um, <laughs> answered questions, uh, not all of which are necessarily well founded in historicity, <laughs> but we, we had some fun with it anyway. Well, it's very creative, Robert. Yeah, yeah. someone suggested uh, we have we invite Jesus Christ, but, uh, <laughs> but we couldn't find anyone to take that role. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's a bit daunting, I think, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can, Thanks for that call. Can I, with your permission, um, Rob? Uh, yeah, Francis uh, came in with another question on um, on uh, Zoom here. <clears throat> she said, "I'm not disagreeing with you about the importance of questions as opposed to definitive answers, mm -hmm. but would like to suggest that the twelve step mm -hmm. fellowships are spiritual programs for helping people recover from addiction." They offer a definitive answer in the form of steps and tra traditions that have proven over time yeah. to be helpful sure. to people. You might be interested, by the way, comment actually that this church over here, we, we had the AA meeting. Yeah, we had the AA meeting. Now, for you, yeah, very yeah. successful, yeah. lively, positive sort of a group. Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, I, I wouldn't dispute that. You know, I think that there's a place, there's a place for structure in people's lives in the AA. AA gives that structure. And there are countless other groups that do as well, for drug other drug addictions. Um, um, you know, happily, I've never, I've never been, uh, you know, subject to those sorts of addictions. Um, and I guess I've always been a guy. You know, even from my, you know, I think my mother. I used to drive her mad because she'd tell me to do something, and I'd say, "Well, why?" You know, and that, you know, usually kids grow out of that, but I never did. <laughs> and I, I, I think, you know, the questions for me have always been more important than the answers in a way. It's not that the answers are, are not important, but as I said earlier, I think answers are always only partial. They're always conditional. They're never complete. And I don't look for complete answers. What I look for is, you know, answers to my questions which are at least um, <laughs> viable, you know, persuasive, but then I keep on trying to ask new questions. So, you know, my, my, my life has really been more about asking questions rather than finding the answers, which is why I'm not a fundamentalist, because I think the fundamentalist seeks the answers and seeks definitive answers which transcend time, which I don't think is possible. I think so. Sorry, they have the answers. Yeah, well, they already have the answers. Uh, and, you know, I guess I'm wired in such a way that I have deep reservations about that sort of way of functioning. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, I would agree with her on that. Yeah. So, look, thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's been... That's it. Is that the end of the questions? We've got one more. Yeah, sure. If, 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 people, okay. if people can tolerate it. That's fine. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just uh, reflecting, um, Jeff, on how you're uh, drawing from, from Jung in terms of your own uh, spirituality. And, and one of the, uh, the interesting things in in Jung's work was his connection with uh, Gnosticism and uh, for example his role in uh, publishing the Nag Hammadi yeah. uh, Gnostic uh, scriptures which uh, discovered in in uh, Egypt mm -hmm. and so it's this uh, deeply heretical approach yeah. where the uh, the the early uh, orthodoxy had sought to stamp out yeah. all dissent and uh, and enforce a uniform imperial faith, mm -hmm. which is somewhat similar to the sort of uh, e evangelicalism that yes. you were uh, describing today, mm -hmm. and and so there's there's just this big challenge. And so what what happened was that 
the, uh, the Gnostics lacked the military and economic power base uh, in a mass movement yeah. that the, the imperial church had. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they were able to be um, eliminated. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, Jung, I think, felt that the, the Gnostic tradition was much more attuned to the spirituality of Christ than the than the orthodox tradition so so he was deeply sympathetic to the esoteric heretical traditions within the west and uh, those are, are traditions that remain very much marginal but uh, but have this sort of uh, philosophical uh, psychological depth to them that mm -hmm. uh, that gives them uh, 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 an ongoing uh, attractiveness and and legitimacy. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was you know um, from the Confessing Church of Germany and was executed in Flossenburg Prison. He was involved in the attempt to assassinate Hitler. Bonhoeffer had a great regard for heretics, for the heresies, and I, I I do too. I mean, I think that heresy is very important really in terms of because it often marks the most creative thinking the thinking on the edges of the church um and gnosticism uh, and docetism and so on were, were examples of that in the early church um you know my instincts as a this is I, look i think sometimes we're wide in different ways as human beings some people like the imperial church other people like the dissenting church i prefer a dissenting church to the imperial one that's just who i am you know i'm wired that way um, can blame my parents for that but you know I, I on the other hand I think you know in relation to Gnosticism and I, I have enormous sympathy for what what Jung is is really getting at there on the other hand I mean the difficulty that I have with Gnosticism is in the sense that it downvalued the material world as I understand it you know it was it tended to be rather ethereal um, to fly off with the fairies a little bit and, you know, my whole experience in liberation theology is precisely that you value the material, you value the realities, the political and social realities around you. You don't escape into an ethereal otherness. So while I have a enormous sympathy for the whole idea of heresy, um, Gnosticism never really appealed to me as such because it seemed to me, you know, that... Um, that Christianity, if it's anything, while, while it is speculative, it's also got to do with material reality, the political and social realities around you, uh, which you have to address in the name of social justice. So, you know, I have a, I'm, it cuts both ways for me, I think, Bob. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm giving a, a paper on, at the Bonhoeffer Congress in January in, I heard in Sydney. In the background. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but uh, I think talking about Jung's connection to the ethereal, mm. again, like it's it's this whole um, esoteric new age aspect yeah. of, of yeah. Jung, like he was interested in astrology, mm. he was interested in alchemy, uh, the occult, his, his theory of synchronicity mm. is, is quite uh, mystical. And uh, so, you know, a lot of these uh, issues have, have, generated a lot of suspicion about Jung as yeah. uh, as somebody who was uh, too uh, you know magical and not yes. grounded and yeah. irrational uh, in his thinking and and yet uh, those traditions uh, have got their I suppose inner coherence yeah. uh, uh, sure they do that, yeah. and and so uh, this this sense that Jung was looking at them in this phenomenological way mm -hmm. uh, just, exploring them in their own terms their own experience and and finding that there's uh there's much to that the the sort of imperial dismissal of those yeah. marginal um attitudes has got uh has led to a lot of uh, significant loss of meaning and uh so so th this sort of syncretistic approach that he also uh, took you know, he was so interested in eastern thought uh, mm -hmm. india china and uh, africa uh, and uh, so this uh, this attitude of uh, religion as something that needs to 
acknowledge the legitimacy and respect for all different traditions. Yeah. Again, you know, that's something that's uh, an anti-imperial uh, approach, which... Uh, yeah, which is, I have enormous sympathy for. I mean, I think the, the way in which, you know, my life has taken me hasn't been toward those more esoteric uh, dimensions. I mean, the, the, the heresies that I've signed, you know, signed up with have been sort of Marxist heresies, which deal with the material realities of things, you know, and Marx is a very significant saint within Latin America amongst the secular. Um, you know, let me finish. I'll, I'll, um, so many years ago, I was involved in trying to establish a centre for ethics in Sydney, and it was to be an Australia-wide phenomenon. And many of the, it was to be a progressive institute and, and the Uniting Church was prepared to help uh, bankroll at uh, some of the Anglican dioceses and even a couple of the Catholic bishops. But George Pell, who was Archbishop of Sydney, was a bit of a problem. <laughs> and none of the priests, uh, the guy who actually asked me to go and see him to re represent the, um, represent the organisation, uh, he's a lay Catholic who'd been a former ambassador to the Vatican, you know, not even he was prepared to go and talk to Phil. So anyway, they asked me if I would do it. And I said, well, why would you want me to do it? And I said, well, you're involved in the organization and you're not a Catholic. So he has no power over you. <laughs> so, so anyway, off I trotted. I was in my forties, I think, you know, mid forties. Um, I should have been old enough to know better, but I, I went and you know, it was, was funny because, um, you know, I mean, um, Pell had done his homework. He knew who I was. He said, oh, you're that Marxist minister, are you, <laughs> from Redfern? I said, well, yes, yes, uh, your eminence, but that's not why we're here. We're here to discuss your attitude toward this burgeoning, you know, ethical organisation that we're getting moving. And, uh, you know, I mean... It was a fairly brief conversation, but I could I could certainly feel the the chill in the room as he um, as he um, marginalised me as a Marxist Christian. You know that was it. That was sort of like the end of the conversation. So, yeah. so you know, I, I think I was very proud to be a heretic at that point. <laughs> Frankly, you know, I walked I walked away rather proud of the fact that George Pell saw me as such. <laughs> But I, I, I guess my heresy has been more in the materialist doctrines and, and, uh, of, of, and, and thinking rather than in the esoteric, more spiritual. That's, that's the life, <laughs> where life's taken. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. And that's, I'd like to present this to you. Thank you. Enjoy. Good. Thank Thanks you very much. That's great, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Lovely. Good. Okay. With further ado, we have um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You've given us a lot to think about and to take home to do our own research. And uh, as you see, <laughs> as it certainly has. And Next month, on Friday the 3rd of November, we have Rod Taylor, who will be our last presentation, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization. So that's a good um, end to the, to the year. Um, we've heard Rod here before, and I'm pleased his updates since then will be of great interest. And he's written a book, so he'll be probably selling his latest book. Um, those of us... So it'll be um, quite interesting. Also, we've been dealing with Kirsten and John's um, adventures in mindfulness, meditation. We were meeting at the church doing that. <laughs> and we did that for eight weeks. And it was rather a marvellous course. Now, would you like to come, John or Kirsten, come out and talk, talk to that? They're running it again. It's online this time. So we don't have to come and have afternoon tea and uh, natter about all sorts of things. <laughs> so, I'll let you. Well, this is going to be an easy one, I think, I hope. It's a pleasant one. Um, it's only six weeks. Um, you want me to use the microphone?
Were you using the microphone? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's, it's, I've added a few, I've deleted a few meditations and added a few. So we've got some new ones coming up this time. Uh, Buddha, 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 and there'll be three others as normal, as we have it as normal. I've been doing these meditations for Goodwin Aged Care now for something like 76 weeks, <laughs> which has uh, been very useful and helpful for the elderly people who live in their own homes. And uh, it's, we, we could, with these, these ones, we do the mandala drawing and journaling with them as well. And you explore your own beingness as you go through each meditation. So um, hopefully it'll you'll like it. It's only online this time. Don't have to come outside your house or anywhere. Just plug in online. Three o'clock on Sunday, starting twenty second, isn't it? Twenty second, three to five. And John does the beautiful brooch. Thank you. Okay, so, oh, yeah, just talk here, yeah, okay. Right. Oh, um, so my name's Deirdre, I'm trained as a counsellor, but I'm not working as a counsellor currently, I'm working in a health capacity, but I'm developing my uh, modalities in therapy, and one of them is about EMDR, which is eye movement, desensitization reprocessing um, therapy oh so i'm i'm training in eye movement desensitization reprocessing um, therapy through the um, international institute of emdr now this was developed by francine shapiro um, who was a um, u.s um, or Canadian psychiatrist. And uh, so having done some training, I'm just looking for one or two volunteers who might be interested in participating in the protocol. It's not traditional talk therapy. And the value of it is that people don't have to tell their whole story about what the problem is. It's very based on a... Um, protocol which is uh, designed for safety essentially uh, so the problem shouldn't be a really major issue or crisis in someone's life it could be a phobia it could be some anxiety or something they feel they haven't yet processed so it's to do with memory and it's based on the notion uh, that we know that when we dream in REM sleep the brain processes the events of the day and um, this this particular protocol it has bilateral uh, stimulation using fingers or tapping uh, along with uh, some guiding words so um, it's simulating the kind of processes that happen with REM sleep and it's been evaluated and found to be um, a very effective protocol so really, um, if, if you feel interested and would like to be a volunteer um, and there is no charge and if you don't like it, you don't have to continue. It would only be like a few sessions um, to go through that. And I can leave my phone number um, and, it, and it's completely confidential. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
Is there anything that you would like to think of um, people to talk with about next year? Just let, let us know and we see if we can find these people um, out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we can find people. So, um, because I know that some of you that's been great. And um, I think there's four people I'm uh, looking at that have spoken Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Who are you? You should have me here. Sit down. Sit right there. Hello. Can you hear me, Jean? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, I can yes, see you, Mary. No, no, you can. Hello, Mary. You've come in. I'm not sure if Jean can. Um, Hello, Mary. You've come in right at the end. Robert's there. Um, I'll just go into the chat room and type yes. something. Oh, here we go. That's what would be weird. 